Coach, thank you so much for coming on today. I'm really excited that I get the chance to talk to you. I know over the past few weeks I've read a lot of articles about Carly, uh, heard podcasts about Carly, and your name comes up again and again and again. So naturally, I wanted to reach out to you and find out uh, what makes you so special to her and how you've been able to coach her and influence her. So before we get started with the questions, I'll give you a brief chance to talk about who you are, what you do, and most importantly, why you coach, and then we'll get rolling from there. So go ahead, Coach. Yeah, um, so I'm James Galanis. I'm the director of uh, Universal Soccer Academy. Uh, we're located in New Jersey. We've actually got an academy also in, in Argentina. Um, and we specialize on, on kids that uh, I like to call soccer junkies, uh, kids that have uh, the passion for the sport. Uh, we've been in existence for um, 17 years now. Um, and um, we've just stuck with working with, with high-level kids that, that live and breathe the sport, um, and we've, we've had quite a bit of success over the years, and the reason why I coach is um, not only for um, seeing my kids do well on the field, but more importantly, um, seeing them become successful human beings off the field. Absolutely. I think that's fantastic. And that's definitely something I, I do want to get into. Before we talk about all the good things a coach can do, one of the first questions I like to ask coaches is simply, in your mind, what is one of the biggest mistakes that a coach can make? What's one thing that a coach should stay away from or avoid doing? Well, I think just um, making coaching um, about themselves, I mm -hmm. think that's, that's the big part. Um, just making sure that um, you're coaching for for the right reasons. A lot of a lot of coaches um, see this as a as a business, or some of them see it as, as something to make themselves feel good. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's really about um, grabbing individuals and bringing the best out of them, and along the way, um, turning them into good human beings. So, just not under really understanding. Um, why you coach a lot of people you know they see it as as a winning they want to coach so they can win mm -hmm. um, but in, in actual fact it's it's you know teaching people um, you know how to deal with winning but also how to deal with losing and then how to deal with life situations absolutely I think that's all very fantastic and I love the fact that you talk about being player centered being focused on the player not making it about yourself you may have alluded to it there in that answer, but I'll ask you on the flip side of that, what's the best thing that a coach can do? I use the game as a tool to create these outstanding human beings. I mean, create outstanding people that, that go out on the field and, and have um, great sportsmanship skills, um, build individuals that, uh, that are fierce competitors, um, build individuals that... Uh, are good teammates that are, are coachable, um, that are adaptable, that um, are basically willing to do everything they can to make um, their team better, which eventually uh, ends up mirroring uh, their life um, as an adult when they when they go out into the workplace. Absolutely. And so, what are some things then, coach, that you do? Where do you start the athletes in terms of of helping them become better? I, I think sometimes in coaching. We all love catchphrases and kind of, I don't want to say cliches, but sort of that same idea. Uh, but a lot of times there's not action behind the words. And obviously with you there is. Otherwise, you wouldn't be as uh, as notarized as you are by Carly because I know you've made an impact on her. So what are some things that you do practically in the everyday sessions to help uh, the athletes become extraordinary human beings like you alluded to there? Well, I when I started this, I, I, I actually started reflecting back on on myself as a soccer player and, mm -hmm. and all the kids that I grew up playing. And obviously we all didn't didn't make it to the highest level. And um, the reason behind that I discovered was um, the mentality wasn't right, the mentality of, of these players I grew up around with. Um, so I kind of took an interest into uh, the mental part of the game mm -hmm. um, because I knew that these players that back then – um, they had the skills, they were physically fit, they knew the game, uh, but what was missing was you know, the mental and character piece. Um, so when, when I coach today, um, I build 
um, my players from the mind on down. Mm. Um, that's the first thing I, I knock over. I make sure that, you know, I've got a, a, a human being, first of all, that, you know, is fully committed, is uh, willing to put the team first, um, is willing to make sacrifices, is willing to empty the tank every single training session mm. and every game, that is respectful, um, that will make the sacrifices off the field in order to be successful. So when my players show up to the field, uh, right from the get-go, I try to instill these mental values values in them that um, end up making it easy to teach them the game and, and make them into a, a skilled um, soccer player in, in my case. So okay. I kind of work from the mind on down mm-hmm. rather than the other way around. Sure. And so then the question I have for you is, do you let opportunities for you to teach mental skills arise from the practice itself or do you sit them down and teach in that kind of setting first and foremost? How does that work with you actually implementing and teaching from the mind down? Yeah, I, I actually do talk to them. I, I, I do spend time, um, you know, almost every week and we, we, we pick subjects. So I pick subjects that we, we talk about, uh, mental subjects. Um, and then I also, uh, I'm always scanning to find opportunities uh, that happen on the field that I use what happened on the field as a tool to not only make that person better, but mm-hmm. the whole team better. So it's a combination of both. You sure. know? Um, you've got to be watching what, what goes on and, and, and extract those, those little negatives, some mental negatives that happen on the field or at training and make it into a lesson. And at the same time, you've got to sit down and, and tell your players, hey, I'm going to teach you something important today, another mental thing. Mm-hmm. Um, this is important. Take a seat, and we sit down, and sure. and we start talking about that stuff. Awesome. And in terms of you studying, learning the mental game, kind of coming to your to your conclusion that this is a very important part for me to start incorporating my coach in my coaching. Did you have a mentor that kind of pointed you in that direction, or someone that recommended certain resources to you, or when you were starting just to dive into the mental aspect, where did you go, and what what all influenced you? Yeah, I um. <clears throat> I think I just always learnt from from everybody, um, and I still do. Mm-hmm. So I remember, uh, as a player, I always tried to get into the mind of my coach and figure out uh, what they were thinking. Yeah. Um, I always, for some reason, uh, didn't only look and admire a, a team when I saw them out on the field. I also was very aware of of the coach. Um, so. I was sort of like intrigued by the mental stuff um, from from a kid, um, and then, like I said, when I got into coaching, um, you know, it it further confirmed to me that the mentality of an athlete is is everything. So yeah, I started to study. I started to to read biographies of great mm. players. I started to read biographies of coaches. I studied um, sports psychology. Um, all on my own, and I still do. Right. Um, and I've just just clocked in the hours myself in learning about the mind, and, right. and that's why I think I'm I'm able to teach it now. Sure. And can, can, would you mind sharing some of those resources specifically that you turn to, whether it be a biography of a player, coach, or even a book on sports psychology that kind of really got you grounded in that field? Can you think of one resource that really got you started? Uh, the book. Uh, Mind Gym, I thought was yeah. was really good. Um, I just reading um, just different sports psychology books uh, along the ways. I I I studied um, uh, Phil Jackson. Yep. Um, there was a great coach in Russia. His name was Valery Lobanovsky, um, who was a, a player, a, a coach that um, basically produced all his players and was able to. Uh, to build like championship winning teams year after year, right. um, teams that were even dominating in Europe, and it was all had to do with the mentality. So I studied the way that he handled um, his players, and just just ongoing um, education, just finding yeah. finding things to read on my own, whether it's through the internet or mm-hmm. or through books and all that. And also, I'll tell you a funny one that I thought mm-hmm. helped me a lot is uh, Psychology for Dummies. Okay. 
You know those little yellow books yeah. that you see in the in the bookstore. Yeah, that that uh, laid a nice foundation for me as well. So fantastic. Um, yeah, it's just about me um, being a student myself and mm-hmm. just just continuing to learn. Uh, yeah, would you say that that also enhances uh, your ability to coach because the players see that you're striving on your own time to make yourself better, and then you modeling that translates to the players. Would you say that that there's a, a real and likely cause? Yeah, I mean, um, see, I think being a, a great coach is um, you improving as your players improve, and that's why you can't think you know everything. Right. Um, you know, as they get better, you your environment that you're providing them has to get better. Mm-hmm. And the only way you can do that is is by remaining a student of the game. And, yeah, my, my kids do mm-hmm. sense that. Um, they do sense that. I, I keep improving because I just keep challenging them. It's not we're sure. not doing the same drills and studying the same things mm-hmm. year after year. Every year I just step it up a notch and right. and and I tell them I'm I'm open. Hey, I'm a student of the game too. I don't know everything. Right. Um, and guess what? This is what I've learned, and this is what we're doing this year. And we we head off and we do it. Absolutely, I think that's fantastic. I I really love to hear that, Coach. Uh, Thank you. You know, a ton of humility. I think it's a great thing for a coach to model. And again, I feel like you and I are kind of thinking along the same lines, which is fantastic to hear. And I know you're doing it at a very high level. Thank so, you. the uh, the the next question I'll have then for you is: When you were just starting to learn these things, obviously you didn't know everything then that you know now. And I'm sure that you did some things back then as a coach that maybe make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Can you think of maybe one mistake that you made when you were uh, coaching early on in your career? that you would share so that we could learn from it? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things that I that I learned and I think changed the way that I coach, I I used to have a vision of of how I wanted the team to play or how I wanted the individual I'm working um, with to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I used to get caught up in in that vision you know, and, and I wanted the team to play a certain way, but the reality is they're not ready for it. Mm. I had to actually drop down levels and find right. where my students actually are and develop an environment from there that will take them to my vision. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you look ahead where you'll walk in and you'll, you'll, you'll see the pieces and you'll see, oh, wow, I've got great players Oh, this one does this, this one does that, this this one is good at this, this one's good at that. Um, and all of a sudden you just think to yourself, oh, I'm, I'm going to have a great team here. And, and you start creating an environment of what you want it to look like at the end instead mm-hmm. of actually coming to where the kids actually are today Absolutely. and building from there. Absolutely. I think that was a big lesson for me anyway. And was it a lesson that you learned very quickly after one time, or is it a lesson that you're still continuing to learn to this day? Oh, yeah, it's part of my uh, coaching methodology now. I, I, that's why I believe in, in evaluations mm-hmm. um, and really getting to know um, the athlete, um, not only in, in skill but also tactically, physically and mentally and seeing exactly where they are and then you start developing, like I said, an environment from where they actually are, not where you want them to be. Right. I know I'm going out of order here with my questions, but That's again, okay. a- as you talk, it just transitions nicely into some. So you, you mentioned there the evaluation process, and I know uh, in 2016, with a lot of technology, there's all these you know analytical data sources. You can track this, you can track that, and sometimes too much information uh, can be paralyzing instead of helpful. So what, what are your thoughts in regard to evaluations what do you uh, what are the areas categories that you hold most dearly and do you think are, are most consistent with actually replicating where the player is yeah look um, I think it's a great tool to have all this technology I think it's good to monitor um, people's mm-hmm. effort at training mm-hmm. um, see, making sure that they are um, working as hard as they can um, I think it's good to monitor fatigue um, to see you know when when a player has worked too hard and actually needs to rest um, for a little bit um, the only negative is that 
a lot of coaches are actually using it as a tool to select their team, mm -hmm. you know, and we're putting like fitness levels in front of the craft itself. Right. So a lot of people are measuring the fitness <coughs> levels of, of these coaches, of these players, I mm -hmm. mean, and they're forgetting um, or they're leaving behind players that have the skill and imagination that can lock, right. unlock a defense. They'd, they'd rather take a kid that is is amazing at, at their performances and physical performance on the field. So mm -hmm. I think it's great for, for you to have as a coach all this technology, but I just think you use it as a tool to help and not as a tool to determine right. who's playing. Right. Yeah, I know that was, when I was talking to Coach Dorrance a few weeks ago, he was talking about his competitive culture and how many people think that's how he chooses his starters. He right. said, no, it's, it's a tool that I use to evaluate my team. Sometimes it's right, but it's not, the, it's not the criteria with which I select my players based on. I think that's very advantageous. What are some ways, James, then, that you track whether a player is working as hard as they can or whether they do need to stop and recover? Is it, more, is it an eye test for you, or do you have like an actual factual method of getting that data? Well... I first of all, I'll I'll do a physical evaluation in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, and then I I will provide an environment um, where I know that if the player gives a hundred percent effort, they will be more than fit to perform well in a game, mm -hmm. um, and if they do that, then I know that they're going to be fit, right. but. But a lot of times, kids don't give 110%, for example. Um, and then when you conduct a test again three months later, um, you know, you, you see that their, their fitness level hasn't really increased. Right. You know, but in general, you know through the eye who's giving 100% and, and who's not. But like I said, that those GPS monitors and the right. technology, it's great to have. I mean, it, it's good to see the little details it provides. Absolutely. I think that is, that is fantastic. Is, is What tests do you use initially to track the athlete's fitness level? Well, I do uh, I do the Cooper test, mm -hmm. um, beep test. Yep. Um, I do vertical jumps and upper body tests with push-ups and sit-ups, just real old-school style. Sure, sure. Um, they work. Um, and... That's what gives me an idea of where my athletes are, and as long as there's progress uh, through the season, I'm happy. Absolutely, absolutely. So, again, we talked there, Coach, about how you, you do value fitness, but it's not the, the end-all, be-all of whether or not you'll take a player. But I want to come back to the idea of what you do value and simply ask you the question is, what are some values that you hold personally that, that you refuse to compromise when you're coaching? Um, well, I think that you know, every every team is different, and you need to come in and, and lay down rules and expectations for for everybody on the team, including yourself as a coach. Mm. Um, so, myself, once I lay down the rules, no matter what happens through that season, I'm not breaking my own rules. Right. I don't care who you are. Um, you know, for example, if you know, let's just say. Uh, one of my better players or my top goal scorer um, we're playing in a game this weekend and you know he's, he's disrespectful to his teammates um, and he, he's just not working in a team environment and shows no respect um, the next week I will have a chat to him after that but the next week even if we're playing against the best team he's not playing mm -hmm. And that's all there is to it. Absolutely. So they're the sort of uh, coaching values that I, I don't I don't turn my back on right. at all. And I think when you do that, you lose you lose your credibility and sure. and and you're finished as a coach. So that's what I do. But mm -hmm. some other people don't do that. No, and, and then I'm going to flesh that out maybe a little further. What's the process look like in terms of you confronting that? Is it you define the expectation and, and the rules? It gets broken, and then you immediately dish out that. Or is there a process with which you kind of ease the player into a consequence? Do you give them a warning or anything of that nature, or is it very cut and dry? No, um, you know, 
the rules are the rules that have been outlined mm-hmm. in a, in a meeting um, before the season starts, and they're placed out there for the team so everybody understands. Um, totally clear, um, and there is no warnings. Mm-hmm. Um, you've been told, um, and if you are disrespectful, for example. Um, you're going to sit the bench. Right. There's going to be a consequence, and that's all there is to it. Because the way that I see it is, if you're disrespectful to your boss sure. later on, um, or you're disrespectful to your workmates later on, mm-hmm. the consequences could be a lot higher yeah. than sitting a game on a bench. Sure. So, as sure. a coach, we have a responsibility to prepare our kids for life, and and I'm not budging from that. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's fantastic. Can you maybe give a few examples of? I know you said that, that the rules may fluctuate from year to year based on where the kids are and what the team makeup is. is. Is there anything that does tend to be consistent across all the teams that you have, Coach? It seems like respect is one of those. Can you think of some other rules that you always have set in place regardless of the team? Yeah, you play You play for the team. Mm-hmm. You're willing to play any position, um, and that could be even, even on the bench. Um, you're respectful to the opponent. You show great sportsmanship. Um, you don't worry about the referees because we can't control their decisions and they're going to make mistakes. Um, and basically, you do everything you can to be um, a good part of the team mm-hmm. um, and somebody that respects the team and and you don't backstab each other, you don't talk about each other, you don't put down the coaching decisions. Right. Um, and you just basically... Being a great human being, that's that's our job as a coach. That's what we want to build, mm-hmm. great human beings. For sure. I, I totally agree with that 100%. I want to move away now, Coach, from the team concept to more of the one-on-one concept and talking about your work with Carly a little bit. And Before we delve into maybe what you do with her specifically, um, you know, obviously I do the same thing for basketball. Um, again, I'm not working with LeBron James, who would probably be the Carly Lloyd equivalent of basketball. <laughs> but... Um, you know, Keep going, you might. Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, for me, I, I'm I'm right there with you. I, I think that you know, you coach to make better human beings. So whoever's in front of you is the most important person. That there's how I try to view it. Um, but my first question is for you, and I know soccer is similar to basketball in that there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, it's not predictable. You know that when the ball changes possession, <laughs> anything can happen. So what what are some ways that you make sure that your one on one training uh, does transfer over to the game setting? even though it may lack certain visual elements or uh, constraints of an actual 11-on-11 game? Yeah, um, well, this is the thing. There's the, there's the technical component, which is everything you do when you're, you're in possession of the ball. Right. So when I, when I, for example, when I work with Carly on that, um, we're actually working on the technique mm-hmm. of everything. Um, so, for example... You know, when you're dribbling a ball, people think it's just as simple as just just dribbling a ball, right. um, running along, and you're just kind of just tapping the ball and and just keep it near you, and you're you're all good. But that's not the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, we actually are working, you know, on the mm-hmm. actual technique mm-hmm. to full on detail. Everything from, you know, there's the ball, the foot that lands next to it, exactly where it lands, um, when it lands, your knee. Um, slightly bent, your chest completely over the ball, mm-hmm. um, your other foot that's that's actually not tapping the ball, it's actually pushing the ball, the angle of the foot, um, the way you're pushing it, how far out you want it to go, the position of your hands, um, there's this, all this detail in, right. in every single technique um, that, we're, that we're improving at training, then there's there's dribbling, there's turning, there's foot skills, receiving, passing, heading, shooting, crossing. There's all these skills right. that that we're working to make better. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to make those skills <laughs> not better, not only better, but more importantly, efficient. Mm-hmm. See, at the highest level, you shouldn't be making mistakes from the basics. Everything that's simple, where the ball comes in and controlling it and (coughs) dribbling and Mm. passing and all those things that we spoke about, you need to be efficient at all them and really never lose the ball. Mm -hmm. 
The only time you should lose the ball is when you take a risk, right. when it's something creative you're trying to do, where it's something out of the ordinary that you're trying to do. So when we work the 1v1, the skill department, that's what we're working towards, building an efficient ball handler. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, Tactically, the movements off the ball, it's hard to work um, when you're doing one-on-one sure. to, to repair all that, mm-hmm. that comes down to um, really um, I encourage Carly to talk to her coaches about the tactical component because it's their game plan. Right. They're the ones that um, know the movements that they want Carly to make mm-hmm. without the ball. Physically, yep, the one-on-one training, um, every day we, we we add a layer of fitness um, onto onto her game. Um, the whole idea is for her to wake up the next day just with a little bit of soreness, mm-hmm. not a lot, right. just a little bit, just to feel like you you have done something. Sure. And, and the soreness means you broke a barrier. So right. if you do fitness and you and you wake up the next day, you don't feel anything. You really didn't get fitter. Right. So we try to find a, a, a spot where she's a little bit um, sore the next day, which we broke a little barrier. Come back the next day, we break another barrier mm-hmm. and keep going and going and going. And then the mental piece, um, that's just ongoing. Yeah. Um, that's just around the clock um, chats and and just learning from mistakes and and building a, a, a strong mind. So right. that's the kind of one-on-one that I do with Carly. Sure. And so when you guys – I know that we, you talk about multiple levels of the game, whether it be technical, tactical, fitness, mental. I want to just redirect back to the technical aspect of it again. Mm-hmm. So all the work that she does, that maybe not all of it, but a good part is simply one-on-o, and you're just enhancing how she does – what she needs to do so she can be more efficient in that, correct? Yes, okay. that's right. And that's so right. then, say for instance, again, I don't know anything about soccer coach, so please forgive me if I uh, if I bludgeon an example here, but I'll, I'll go ahead and yeah, take a stab okay. at it. Um, so talking about dribbling the ball then, obviously there is the, the physical technique of how to dribble the ball effectively and efficiently, but also you have the aspects of being able to find space to dribble, knowing when to dribble as opposed to when to pass. Do you and Carly get into that at all? Any of the decision-making elements to it, or how does that work in, within the one-on-one? Yeah, that uh, that's tactical. <clears throat> um, so it's not something that I really talk to her too much about, right. as in exactly where she's got to stand <clears throat> on the field, because that's a coaching thing. Sure. But in general, um, and basketball would be the same. You've got to make the movements to buy space. Right. You, you buy space, you buy time, more time, more time to make a good decision. Mm-hmm. So what what I do do is um, I do I do spend time with Carly in a gym, um, and I invite uh, some of my trainers out there, and we play five v five in a really small gym. Right. And the whole idea there is to force her to make quick decisions. Right. See, that's the big part. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, making those quick decisions, it's actually training the mind. Right. And that's the only way that I can do it is if I just squeeze her in a place where where she's just constantly got to be thinking more than anything. And while we're in there, I'm not too worried about the skills. For me, it's quick decisions, quick decisions, find space, quick decisions, know what you're doing before you get the ball. Right. And not only that, um, when you do get the ball and you pass it to someone, you're not just thinking of that person, but you're thinking of right. that person being able to pass it to the next person. Right. So trying to think two plays ahead. Sure. You know, so we do work on that, mm-hmm. um, but it's not one-on-one. I've got to include other people. Of course, of course. Yeah. And I, I know that that, that in any sport like basketball, like soccer, that, that is an open and fluid game. That always becomes the challenge. Um, and I think sometimes, at least in my experience, whenever you try to recreate every, it's it's not possible to recreate a game with one other person. And I think sometimes you can actually hurt the player whenever you try to do that because then you, you you're not using your time as beneficially as it could be. You know, in a one on one, your best, the two things you can really, or three things, is mental toughness, that that aspect of the game, their physical condition or their physical fitness, and then the technical aspect. And so I think 
like you mentioned there, I think it's great that you do put Carly in the environment where she has to make those decisions. It's cool to hear how you go about doing that. Now, I'll transition back to the team, and then I'll come right back to the one-on-one. -on -one. Because, yep. again, you got me thinking of, of, of more questions That's here. That's great. When you're with your teams, then, uh, at, at the soccer academy, and I'm sure this changes based on what point in the season you're in, what degree do you use drills or games that teach skills like the small confined space to promote decision making as opposed to technical training with those players? Okay, that's a good question. So I think what makes uh, my academy unique is, so I work with the kids for two hours at a time. Right. And I spend a whole hour on adjusting their technique and mm -hmm. doing technical skills. Um, just, again, I'm trying to make them... Uh, better ball handlers and sure. efficient as well. Sure. And then for the rest of the time, for an hour after that, I let the kids play with freedom mm -hmm. where I want them to make their own decisions. I want them to be problem solvers all on their own. So I design different size fields, different types of games, attacking games, defending games, right. possession games, um, quick thinking games. Um, where I let them make the decisions. I want them to play with freedom. Mm -hmm. You see, um, this is a big problem with our with our game today. Not not only soccer, but I think in all sports, uh, a lot of coaches are over coaching. Mm -hmm. So they they always hopping in and 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 trying to show the kids what to do um, next, kind of a thing. Right. When I'm not a fan of that. Right. I like to just let them figure it out. Sure, if, it, if there's a disaster going on, right. I'll hop in. Right. You know? Um, but I like to see them, you know, let's just say we're playing a game and, and, and in this game the only way you can, you can score a goal is if you use the wings, for mm -hmm. example, go wide. Um, you know, I'm not going to go sit there and tell them right off the bat. Right. I want to see them figure it out on their right. own. Absolutely. And that, that might take 10 minutes. That might take 20 minutes. But I'm sitting there watching. And as I'm watching, um, if I see them have success and figure it out, that's when I'll hop in and applaud right. and say, good job. And now, the next time these kids go out and play and I set out an environment for them, they know I'm not going to give them the answer. And all on their own, they're going to start thinking right. and now we've got a problem solver mm -hmm. because in both basketball and in soccer, things happen so quick in nanoseconds seconds, where you've got to figure it out. Yeah, without a doubt. You see what I mean? Oh, for sure. I, I think there is, there's definitely a lot to be learned, you know, comparing. Like I've gotten some great ideas for games like that from soccer coaches. You know, Twitter is fantastic because so many people share so much good stuff. Right. And so I follow a bunch of soccer guys on there, and I'll see they're doing this game. And obviously, it's I don't steal it directly, but I'll take an idea or two from it and implement it in what I'm doing, which is very very enjoyable. You mentioned there, there's parts of your training where you're involved, you're giving a lot of feedback, you're teaching, and then the last hour, for say, in that two-hour session, you kind of take your hands off a little bit. When you are coaching a tech, like like a technical skill or a technical aspect of a skill, when you when when you give feedback to a player, is it related to what they're doing with their body, or do you talk in analogies and metaphors and ways that maybe help the player better understand? I don't know if that makes any sense. I I can clarify it for you if, if need be. Yeah. Um, so I have um, if I am to hop in. Um, there is times when I would give them a, a, a technical tip, which mm -hmm. is, you know, you, that ball came from there. You actually should have used the inside of your foot and your first touch should have went this way um, and that way you were moving away from traffic and if you look over here, right. so I will hop in and fix technical stuff mm -hmm. every now and again. And then there's other times when I just hop in and fix tactical stuff. Right. So it's either one or the other that that I'm fixing. And then and then at the end, um, I always um, give them you know a, a signal of yep five minutes to go. You know even though the score let's just say the score is 
uh, it's 2-2, two, two, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll make up a score. So, okay, five minutes to go, Team 2 is losing 2 nothing, and you've got to score two goals in the next five minutes. Right. So I give them a mental challenge, you sure. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Uh, and you guys need to lock the house down for the next five minutes. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. So I give them some mental stuff to work on as well. Absolutely. And then, same question, but in relation to your work with Carly, when it's just you guys one on one doing an individual uh, technical session, in term, how much feedback do you give to her? I mean, I'm sure it differs because of the quality player that she is. Um, can, can you maybe talk about some of the cues that you would give to her? How frequently they happen? Um. Yeah, look, um, like I said to you before, you know, as a coach, it's 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 up to you to continuously um, find an environment for your players that is slightly uh, that is that is challenging for them. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's just say Carly um, today is at at this level. Yep. Um, my job is to create an environment that's slightly above her sure. level. So I want to make her uncomfortable. I want to give her things to do that she's not capable of doing. Right. So she'll mm-hmm. spend the mm-hmm. first half an hour of the, the session um, struggling to, to, right. to do the activities that I'm giving her. Mm-hmm. But I know by the end she'll get it. And once she gets right. it, she gets a little bit better. So probably for that first half hour, I will show her what I'm looking for. I will, yep. I will explain to her this is what we're trying to do. But the whole idea is to, to provide an environment, like I said, that that here's the level of your player. You create an environment that's slightly above that level, mm-hmm. and then your player reaches that level, and now that's how we got better. Absolutely. And so then the next question I have in terms of feedback that you give during a technical drill is, do you select the cues and the teaching points prior to that session, or do you just kind of bring them up off the cuff based on what you see? And then how do you avoid overcoaching in those moments? No, I just, um, I do it on the fly. Yeah. Um, you know, I see something that needs an adjustment, I'll, I'll hop in and um, I'll explain, I'll, look, you know, you, you, your body should be like this or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and, and make the adjustment um, there and then. And then if I, if I see that um, my player or even Carly is still struggling with it, um, I'll leave it alone. I'll I'll actually change drill, and then go back to it at some some other stage. Right, but that doesn't happen very often. Sure. And then, how many mistakes do you like them make before you decide you have to step in and give feedback? Uh, that's a good question because I I always do that. I I'll tell them what I want. And then I'll let them go knowing they're not going to be able to do it. Right. So I'll, I'll let them go for at least a couple of minutes of doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. And then I'll, I'll hop in and, and, and I'll start making adjustments. Now, sometimes you hop in and you might find like four or five things that they're doing wrong. Right. Um, so I'll fi- I'll, first I'll fix the, the biggest thing um, that I see wrong. And then I'll start knocking over the little stuff sure. until we get it. And then, last question I have kind of in terms of this, in those first few minutes when you are just watching and letting them get it wrong, are you silent on the side? Are you giving encouragement and praise? How do you handle yourselves then in, in those little moments of time? Um, I'm smiling and letting them fail. Okay, good, 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 good. And so then, that's going to transition to my next question for you then, is obviously... You know, you talked about earlier wanting to be a positive, uh, positive influence and and, and a uh, a teacher for for those that you work with. So obviously, you need to treat them respectfully, um, but at the same time, giving praise incessantly and constantly can be very detrimental to a player, and it also weakens. Uh, you know, whenever you tell a player something that they're doing well, it weakens it if you're always giving it out. So, how do you navigate that? How do you temper? Um, Making sure that you're not over praising and that you are only praising behavior and skill that is praiseworthy. Well, there's this uh, there's this unwritten coaching rule that I've learned over the years. It, it should be a three to one ratio, ratio, where three positive things to to every one negative thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I don't think. 
it's all about the wording. That's what I think. I yeah. mean, you know, you yeah, you want to say good job, and when they do something right, you want to let them know. Um, and then when not doing something right, you know, it, it's all about you know how you explain it. You, you know, even if the the athlete is is, is far away from um, achieving a, a skill or or a tactic, um, you know, and you know in your mind that they that they've got a long way to go. Um, you, you don't want to make them feel like they're really far away, right? Um, yeah, you know, and it's 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 all psychology, you know. It's all about, you know, at the end of the day, making the athlete feel like you are getting better. Mm-hmm. Um, you're a great student, um, but you still got a lot of work to do. Right. They're the three things I think that your athlete needs to know. Um, if they feel that, you know. They're horrible. That they're they're far away from even the little goals. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard for them to to come to to training motivated. Sure. You know, fun is progress for 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 athletes. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you're progressing and you're succeeding, that's what makes it fun. Sure. Absolutely. So then, I'll, I'll just ask you a few more questions, then, Coach, kind of about your experience with Carly before we wrap up here. Um, the very first one I'll, I'll ask you is just from your perspective. Again, I told you like I listened to a podcast that she was on with Michael Gervais. Uh, you know, countless articles where she was interviewed, and your name popped up again and again and again and again. And obviously, she's the one putting in the work. She's the one going out and performing. But still, she attributes a lot of her success to you. And so, from your perspective, what are some things um, that you've done with Carly that you feel make you such an important part and, and an important person in her life? Um, I think you have to go back to when Carly first approached me. Um, she was um, a player that had been uh, cut from the under-21 teams. Mm-hmm. She was a player that um, that did everything she can to play at the highest level. Um, and she basically had a lot of people around her that that um, would just tell her, "You're you're going to be great. You're doing great. Look how skilled you are. Look how good you are. Don't worry. Just hang in there." Um, and she hit a brick wall and didn't know um, what else she could do um, to get to that next level. And she felt um, she felt hurt that you know she had. She had put in all this time and didn't ever make the under-21 right. teams. So when she met me, um, what I was able to do um, was actually find her weaknesses, mm-hmm. um, which nobody had told her before. Right. Um, and I think right off the bat, um, because of, again, the way that I told her about her weaknesses. It, it wasn't in a rude, disrespectful right. way. It was like, hey, Carly, you're great at at skills. You're very savvy. However, you know, physically, you're really not fit. Mm-hmm. I think mentally, you need to be a bit more competitive and have a bit more fire in you. And I don't think you're very coachable right now, and I think you're mm-hmm. just um, really... Um, more or less focused on yourself rather than the big picture of the team. And if we can grab those three negatives of your game and not only improve them, turn them into strengths, you can go on and become the best player in the world. Right. And I told her that when I first met her. Mm-hmm. Of course, she didn't believe me. Right. Um, but that's what I said to her. Um, so we got to work and... And I had three months to prepare her for the under-21 team because she got re-invited back in because somebody got hurt. And as soon as she went to the camp, went last in the fitness to a person who was up there in the fitness. Um, She was um, top of the pack. Mm -hmm. Um, She went from a player who, um, you know, thought about herself to understanding that this is a team sport Um, and she went from a player who would get on the field and and try as hard as she can every now and again to a player who just worked as hard as she can every single day Mm -hmm. 
So just for, with, from the beginning, these little transformations completely changed her game right? Um, and put her back on track. And then since then, like I said previously, I've been able to find an environment for her that has right. continuously made her better little bit by little right. bit every single day. And I've also been able to help her navigate through all the um, mental obstacles that pop up in a, sure. in a team sport. I've taught her how to deal with her coaches. I've taught her how to deal with her, her teammates um, and put the, the coach and her teammates first in front of herself. Mm-hmm. So she has seen this progress and she has seen this coach that she's got behind the scenes that has helped her. And what I think the important thing is, John, is that, and this is the way that I coach too, Carly knows that I am working for her. Mm-hmm. She doesn't feel like she's working for me. Right. And that something that I translate to with all my students. My students know that I'm working for them mm-hmm. rather than they're working for me. Sure. And when your athletes feel that, they'll run through a brick wall for you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's what's happened with Carly. She knows that you know, I'm committed to her. I'm, I'm committed to making her better and I've been there for her 24-7 and that's why she knows, uh, well, that's why she, she says the things that she says um, when she gets out there because she honestly feels them. It's not like, right. you know, there's some type of agreement or, sure. or, or I'm paying her to say those things. Right. Um, and also through this whole thing, I've worked with Carly for free. I've right. never taken a single cent from her mm-hmm. um, from day one. I still don't. Right. Um, it's just a win-win situation sure. for both of us, and she knows that I care about her, and and that's why she's she's open to telling the world that I've got this special person in the co- in my corner that's yeah. helped me get all the way. Very good. I, a lot of really good stuff in there. Thank you for sharing that. I'll ask you one more question, Coach, and then I'll uh, then I'll let you go. And again, thank you so much for sharing your time with Not me. Not a problem. Um, this could be any athlete, Carly or anybody else. I know you've probably worked with a whole slew of players, but what's the most powerful thing you've ever seen a player do in a training session or in practice that just you made you stop and think, I just witnessed something great? Can you think of, of a story or a, or a moment in time? Um, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, look, the most powerful thing that, that, that I've seen, and I'm going to go back to Carly, mm-hmm. is, um, is seeing the, the, the mentality of, of Carly um, continuously grow um, over the years. And I'll, and I'll tell you something that is, uh, to me, uh, the most powerful thing that I've, that I've seen is... Um, one hour after the World Cup final, um, Carly called me and, and, and I said congratulations and, and all that. Um, and 10 seconds into our conversation, the first thing she says is, um, I'm not stopping. Yeah. And I said, that's great. I'm proud of you. Um, I'm so happy you said that and we've got to keep going. There's still got another five years and we've got a lot more to achieve right. and, and so on. Um, and then she said to me, um, so, so when am I training again? Right. She wanted to know when she's training again. This is one hour right. after she had won, um, the team had won the, the, the World Cup final. Mm. And then most recently, she won the Women's yeah. Player of the Year. And, you know, we, 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 she got the award. Um, we're having a... a, a something to eat afterwards and we're sitting there, uh, Carly, her fiancé and myself and and again, she wanted to know what's going on with training and am I going to give her extra stuff to do while she's in camp with the women's national team. So for me, um, you know, she's the she's the model of, of, of power. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a person that, you know, has ticked the highest box you could possibly tick sure. in terms of, you know, scoring a hat-trick in the World Cup final, mm-hmm. becoming the best player in the world, and all she can think about is, 
when am I going back out on that field right. to become better? Right. I don't think there's anything you can see more powerful yeah, than that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's fantastic. When did you, I know I said last question, I'm going to throw that's one, right. one more your way. What, when did you see her start to turn the corner? I know she mentioned, I think it was, what, 13 years you guys have been working prior to the, the FIFA Award and the World Cup. At what point in that, I know you said from the get-go that she could be the best player in the world. When did you start to see her buy into that and change her habits to make that happen? Uh, look, there, there was immediate, um, an immediate turnaround in, in her attitude and an immediate turnaround in, in, in her in, improvement right mm-hmm. off the bat. Um, and I don't think there's, there's not one particular time that I saw a turnaround, but I can tell you after the 2012 Olympics, that's when she started to really believe that she can go on and become the best player in the world. Mm-hmm. Until then, um, she was training. She was training like a the dog. I was telling her that you can go on and become the best player in the world, but she never really believed it. Right. But after 2012, right. where she, she played really well in every single game of that Olympic campaign, I think she came out of that and she was just a way different person way more confident sure. and she knew that she can carry the team if needed. Absolutely. That, that's such fantastic stuff. And I know this last hour or so that we've talked has been very beneficial for me. I, I love to learn and so I'm so grateful, for Coach, for you sharing time out of your day. I know that you have a lot going on and it means the world to me. So uh, before we do leave, again, this will be on YouTube so people are going to go ahead and watch it. Just let the audience know where they can find you, learn more about you and uh, and kind of even more about your academy if, if they have any interest in that. Well, first thing I want to say is um, I agreed to do this interview because I did I did watch um, the Anson yeah. um, interview and and I discovered a, a, a young coach that um, is a student and open to learning and Amazing. don't have an ego and you can see that you're a student of the game and I I did this more um, to help you well, and thank you. To, to help you learn because I can see the passion there and you're obviously putting in the extra hours and uh, you're willing to learn from, from other people. So I just want to say that it's very admirable to see someone like you doing what you're doing. Thank so, you. So just keep it up. Thank you. I appreciate um, that. Yeah, in regards to me, um, yeah, I'm at Universal Soccer Academy. We're in New Jersey. Um, you know, just love working with um, young, serious soccer players. So if there's any young players out there from anywhere, uh, from around the country and even the world, just look us up, universalsocceracademy.com. Come on down, and uh, I know that we'll give you a training experience like you've never had before. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Coach. Enjoy the rest of your day, and best of luck with everything that you have coming up here in the future. All right, John. Thank you. Yep. Take care, Coach. Bye. Bye.